anything else who are at Booth. Um, and like Dimitri said, feel free to unmute and interrupt whenever or uh, ask questions in the chat if you prefer that. So we're gonna be interested, as you can tell based on the title, uh, we're interested in return expectations. Mm. So I kind of want to start just by setting the stage in terms of where the expectations literature has been uh, in the last decade or so, sort of a high level gloss. Um, and so there, there have been a few questions, of course. Uh, we're going to focus on macro or market level expectations. So what's the expected return on the market or the expected return in excess of the risk free rate? How does that thing evolve over time? Um, when you compare ex ante expectations to ex post realizations, are there systematic errors in those expectations ex ante? And, um, you know, I think we found out a decent amount of stuff from this set of questions. Um, I do want to argue that it is a funny place to start when studying expectations for a couple of reasons. Uh, so to set that up, um, start from a standard uh, Campbell-Shiller type accounting identity uh, for the price dividend ratio. Um, I've grayed out these cash flow expectations. We're not going to be that interested in those today. So we're interested in return expectations. Of course, uh, prices are higher if uh, return expectations are lower, all else equal. And what I want to argue is effectively what the literature has studied so far in, in studying return expectations is effectively what is the contemporaneous, as of time T, one period expected return for some investor or set of investors. Um, and one period can differ depending on the, the focus of the study, but mostly speaking, I think that this literature has studied this first term. So as of today, the contemporaneous expected one period return on the market. So why is that a, a sort of funny starting point? A couple of reasons. First, if you wanna study whether there are systematic errors in these expectations, you're gonna to have to compare ex ante expected returns with ex post realized returns. And that's a sort of difficult, low powered econometric uh, test in the sense that ex ante expected returns just very much less than realized returns. There's a ton of noise in realized returns. It's gonna be hard to detect any signal out of that noise when studying whether there are errors in return predictions. The other aspect of this that's, that's a little bit funny is that uh, from the standpoint of understanding the variation in prices, we need to know something about the full term structure of expected returns at all horizons, not just contemporaneously. Um, and so we're going to try to shed light, as you can sort of tell, on that second term and ask, what is the expected future expected return or equity premium? Um, how does that compare to the actual future equity premium? Uh, and so we're sort of comparing apples to apples here. I'm going to effectively be asking, uh, say, some given investor, what do you think your own expected return on the market will be in J periods? for the following period, and then go back to that same person and ask them in J periods, now what is your expected return for the following period? And so we're comparing expectations ex ante to expectations ex post, and asking if there are systematic errors in these expected return predictions. Um, so we sort of get past the issue of comparing expected to realized returns, we're comparing expected returns just on a forward basis to a spot or contemporaneous basis um, and, and studying this term structure of expected return predictions. So just to set up some notation and jargon, um, we're going to be after what we call the spot rate at multiple horizons. So the spot rate mu at horizon n is the expected law of return on the market. Uh, for the coming n periods. And our goal is to measure this at multiple n's, so short and long at minimum. The idea being, if we can see short horizon expected log returns and long horizon expected log returns, we get to difference uh, and by iterated expectations, calculate what we'll call a forward return expectation or forward rate for short. And that's the expected one period 
spot rate starting in n periods, and that we get just by differencing the n plus one and n period spot rates and applying iterative expectation. So again, for short, I'll call that the forward rate. And then what we can do is use that forward rate again as a measure of the one period expected log return in n periods and compare it in n periods with the actual spot rate at that point for the following period. So we're just trying to implement exactly the exercise I've laid out on the previous slide, which is I go ask an investor, what do you think your one period expected return will be in n periods? What is it actually? And I'm going to call the difference between those two things the forecast error. Now, the terminology here is uh, by analogy to term structure of interest rates. And it is also why we study expected log returns to be able to meaningfully difference across horizons. Mm. I'm going to come back to this question of the parallels between what we're doing and the interest rate setting in a few slides, since there are, of course, some subtleties. Now, I've defined things here about as simply as I can, just to, uh, to keep this, uh, you know, without too much added notation and complexity. For the most part, though, instead of considering expected log returns not netting out any risk-free rate, we are going to be considering spot and forward risk premium net of the risk-free rate. Uh, and that's largely just because this spot and forward risk premium is going to be a little bit better behaved and more stationary once we get rid of the trend decline in the risk-free rate that's going to affect this uh, sort of gross of risk-free rate spot rate. So the first question is, how do we go about measuring these things? Um, and we're going to come about this, come at this question in, in a couple ways. First, with option prices. Um, and so that's going to be the derivatives focus part of the talk. Uh, and we're going to come up with a, a new set of theoretically motivated tools to measure forward rates and forecast errors in those forward return expectations. And so effectively, what we're going to be able to do is test whether expectations of expected returns are intertemporally consistent. And I am not going to be taking a stand at all on whether those expected returns at any given point are themselves rational. So I'm really just comparing ex ante return expectations with ex post return expectations forward to spot. I'm not going to say anything about do those return expectations line up with realizations at any point in time. Now, we think that we're going to be making some progress here in terms of backing these objects out uh, without overly strong restrictions on the data generating process or preferences or anything else. But you still are going to need to, to swallow one assumption there in order to believe what we're doing. Um, and so it is a model-based exercise at the end of the day. And so to complement the option-based measurement, what we're going to do is turn to a couple surveys. Uh, so we look for a couple surveys where uh, we can get return expectations at not just one horizon, but multiple horizons, which is going to allow us to calculate the forward rate and forecast errors. And uh, we looked uh, all over, in fact, and, and found a couple surveys that asked for return expectations at multiple horizons, the Livingston Survey of Professional Economists and Forecasters, and the Duke CFO Survey. Um, and uh, so we are going to be able to back out sort of model-free estimates of spot rates, forward rates, and forecast errors in these surveys, at least. Now, the data is not going to be as rich as, as we'll see later. Um, we will still be able to make some meaningful statistical statements, and uh, they will line up nicely with the option-based measurement. But I sort of prefer the option-based measurement just because you get a bigger panel of countries, a longer time series, and can measure more frequently. Okay, so that's part one is just sort of methodologically, how do we go about measuring these things? And part two is, is what do we find? So first we find in both contexts, measured with options, measured in surveys, uh, we find that forward rates are consistently counter cyclical. So in bad times, uh, when the market is down, forward return expectations, expectations of future equity premia go up. Uh, we think this is an interesting finding in and of itself along with the fact that it uh, is consistent in both the options and surveys. And that is going to contrast with uh, some evidence of extrapolation in some surveys of past returns. So we find the opposite of that. 
when past returns are low, forward return expectations are higher than usual. Um, and so we're going to argue it's quite important to be looking at these longer horizons and, and calculating these forward-looking return expectations as opposed to just spot or contemporaneous short horizon expectations. And what we find is that when those forward return expectations go up in bad times, they in fact go up by too much. So these return expectations are too counter cyclical relative to their own subsequent realization. So we go to a set of investors, the market's down. They say that in the future, expected returns will be persistently higher, uh, elevated by quite a lot and for quite a while. And then we go and ask those same investors in the future, now what do you think the expected return on the market is after the fact? And compare that with their ex-ante forecast. And we find that, uh, in fact, the market return expectation, according to those same investors, has mean reverted much quickly than they themselves expected. So we find uh, this excessive counter cyclicality in forward return expectations. And uh, that leads to excess volatility in forward return expectations relative to the predictable, predictable component of spot expected log returns. So I think it's useful just to illustrate uh, in a few sort of cherry picked crisis episodes that uh, make things look quite nice and easy to understand. So in all three cases here, what I'm doing is plotting the forward curve. So this is the one month forward expected return starting in each of the months on the x-axis in the 1998 Russian debt crisis, 2008 financial crisis, 2020 COVID recession. And this is conditioning on the beginning of the crisis already having happened. So this is in 2020, at the end of March, uh, what do we measure based on option markets for the forward expected log return on the market? And so as of the end of March, the forward expected return is equal to the spot expected return. So this March point is just the zero month, one month annualized expected log return on the market. This April point is what do we measure based on option markets? What do we measure as the expected log return on the market starting at the end of April for the following month and so on. So starting at the end of May for the following month, starting at the end of June, and so we can see a couple of things. First, after the onset of a crisis, these forward return expectations have increased quite dramatically. Um, we see that most at short horizons, so for spot return expectations. But it's true at longer horizons too. But at the same time, the longer horizon expectations do bake in some amount of mean reversion. So the option market at least seems to understand that when uh, the expected return is elevated, it will not be elevated forever. Uh, so there's some amount of mean reversion here. And then what we're gonna do is compare those expectations ex ante from the forward curve at the crisis onset to the realized one month spot rate, again, measured in option markets ex post. And so at the end of April, what do option markets say the one month spot return expectation is? And we see again, there's mean reversion. So spot expected log returns are consistently quite a bit higher after a crisis onset. And then they revert back to their mean uh, reasonably quickly. And in fact, more quickly than the market expected ex ante. So the forward curve, even though it gets the fact that there is mean reversion, it gets that fact correct. It underestimates how quickly that mean reversion is gonna take place. And so this is what we refer to as excess counter cyclicality in these forward return expectations. The market is too pessimistic, thinks that risk premium will stay high for longer and by more than it ends up doing when you go back and ask them after the fact. And interestingly, we find the same thing, not just in these cherry picked crisis episodes, but uh, over the full sample in a counter cyclical way and in surveys. Uh, so this pattern is quite consistent no matter where we look. And I'll show you evidence of that as I go. 
we think this is interesting and important for, for a bunch of reasons, and hopefully I'll have a bit of time at the end to get into some of these. Um, first, it matters for understanding variation and volatility in stock prices. So when we see prices drop, that partly reflects that for a given level of cash flow expectations, investors expect persistently high uh, returns and risk premia going forward. Now you go ask them after the fact, and it seems as if the market didn't realize how quickly their own sense of the risk premium would mean revert. And if they understood ex ante, the persistence of the equity premium, then that would mean prices would drop by less upfront. Um, and so we would see more modest fluctuations in prices. And so we're gonna put some numbers on, on that calculation. We think it matters as well for uh, explaining, at least in part, some interesting other facts uh, from recent literature about uh, equity and derivatives markets, including inelastic demand, uh, some certain stylized facts about the equity term structure. Um, and then, of course, it speaks directly to the cyclicality of subjective expected returns and models of belief formation. So I'll, I'll get into these at the end of the talk. So here's my roadmap for the rest of the talk. I wanna talk for, for a bit about how we go about measuring these things. What are the identification challenges? Just so we're all on the same page about those. I'm gonna actually start with the survey-based measurement before getting into option prices, uh, just because I think the surveys are a little bit more straightforward to understand the exercise. Then I'll discuss the evidence that we find when we measure data on forward expectations. And I'll talk about the forecast errors that we back out. There is a meaningful predictable component to them and talk very quickly through some candidate explanations for those predictable forecast errors. And then for a bit longer about what we think their implications are before wrapping up. Um, why don't I pause just for a second here in case anybody has any questions. Uh, can I jump in? So, like, we will get to the option-based expectation measures, but my sense is they're decently correlated with VIX. Will you be able to disentangle the effect of just volatility from uh, the effect of return expectations over there? This is a good question. So, um, it's going to be, in fact, an implied ball measure that we are using in options in order to, to back out something that's going to get at first moment return expectations. And so sort of like the, the reduced form way of thinking about what we're finding is just that there's something interesting about the, the term structure dynamics of implied vol, such that uh, if you like forecast errors and forward implied vol uh, line up with the way I'm talking about forecast errors and, and expected returns. Um, and we'll talk about why we think it is useful to think about these implied vol moments as telling us something about subjective uh, expected returns. But but I think, you know, again, it's going to be a set of model-based statements that I make. And so that's where I think the survey data is going to be useful for providing some consistent evidence. Yeah, since uh, since Dima opened the, the question, uh, it, it, it seems like the excess um, cyclicality would be perfectly consistent with using a risk neutral proxy of volatility rather than a physical proxy of volatility and then having your risk premia being proportional to that volatility. Uh, is this going to be an issue that you are going to take care of? Is this the assumption I'm going to have to swallow that you know the volatility is observed under the P measure or? So we're going to be looking at volatility under the risk neutral measure, and we're going to be arguing that it is informative about uh, expected returns under the physical measure. And that's that we translation. Know, we, know that volatility, we know that volatility is much pers is more persistent and and, you know, so. so my anyways we'll, we'll get the, we'll get there when we get to the to the measurement of the risk premium but if if you have something like lambda times vol uh, where lambda is a price of risk and if your vol is under q rather than being under p then most of the of the cyclicality could be just essentially kind of cyclicality coming from the variance risk premium right yes this is it's it, this is a, a good line of questioning so i <laughs> 
The one thing that's going to be very hard to explain under that interpretation is that you're going to need that price of, of risk to change signs cyclically. So it's not just that in crises. Okay. So, so yeah, five. let's, let's get there. I get, I think I get the point, but let's, yeah. let's wait until we have the equation. Yeah. Okay. So, so let me back up quickly in case uh, some of you did not get to where I'm going as, as quickly as, as those questions. Um, so, so just what are the identification challenges? Again, what we're trying to do is measure expected returns on the market at multiple horizons. Uh, so short horizon, long horizon. If we can measure those things, then we can back out a, a forward return expectation. And, and so the question is, of course, you know, I know how to do that measurement, at least in principle, when I go to the risk-free term structure. Um, I can look at risk-free rates at short and long horizons, calculate a forward rate. Um, but how do I do that for, for a risky asset? So that's going to be challenge one. If I circumvent that challenge in some way and back out a forward return expectation, then I'm going to compare it with future realized short-term return expectation. And I want to call the difference a forecast error. Now, Again, I think it's useful to think through the analogy to the term structure of risk-free rates here. In that case, I can't compare forward and realize spot rates and expect to be able to say something useful about uh, subjective errors in uh, expected returns or expected risk-free rates. We know that forward rates measured using prices at least are not equal to subjective expectations of future spot rates. Uh, because of the existence of a risk premium. Uh, so prices don't have to equal subjective expectations in the risk-free term structure or in a risky term structure if we're measuring things using a risk-neutral measure rather than a physical measure. So in the risk-free case, uh, we sort of know that the expectations hypothesis fails. It uh, is not a new statement that forward rates don't predict future spot rates. It's just a restatement of the failure of the expectations hypothesis. And so we want some way of measuring things under the physical or subjective measure, as opposed to the risk neutral measure so that we can say something about these two. And so again, we're gonna have two strategies for, for getting past these two challenges. First, uh, more simply is find a set of surveys that ask for subjective expectations of short horizon returns on the market and long horizon returns on the market. And of course, you may take issue with certain aspects of, you know, are these people really thinking through forward return expectations in the way that we want them to be? Uh, the data is not going to be uh, as rich as maybe we would want. And so we're also, again, going to turn to a set of theoretically motivated derivatives prices to get at these questions as well. But ultimately, just to reiterate, we're really after measuring subjective expectations under a, a physical measure as opposed to a risk neutral measure. Okay, so first for the surveys. Evan, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, just a quick clarifying question by, by, from Alessio. Uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you could just revisit your definition of what's a realized exposed expectation, just to be super clear on what's ex ante and what's exposed. Sure, so why don't I go back? So realized ex post is what is the expected one period in this case? The expected one period return on the market as of n periods from now. And I'm going to compare that to the ex ante forward rate, which is at time t, what do you expect the one period expected return to be in n periods? So expected returns ex ante, expected returns ex post. Excellent. Thank you. I, I hope this answers your question, unless you otherwise I'll let you jump in. So we're going to do this in the survey data at a couple different forward horizons. So the first survey we turn to, again, is the Livingston survey, a survey of professional economists and forecasters. Since the early 90s, this has been run through the Philly Fed. They do it twice a year in uh, June and December. And what they do at, at those dates is they ask, what is your expected S&P 500 price 
in six months and in 12 months. So say the survey is taking place at the end of December, what do you expect the level of the S&P 500 to be at the end of the following June and at the end of the following December? And so we're gonna be able to back out from their capital gain expectations. So we are getting rid of the dividend component here uh, and we can calculate spot rates. Our long horizon in this context is gonna be 12 months, short horizon is gonna be six months. And by differencing the two, we can calculate a forward rate, which is based on this survey, what does this set of forecasters expect the expected return on the market to be in six months time for the following six months? And we're gonna line that up ex post again here with in six months time, now what do they expect the return on the market to be over the coming six months? Now, one of the nice features of the Livingston survey is they also ask for expectations of risk-free rates uh, in six and 12 months. And so when we're taking out that risk-free component to consider forward and spot risk premia, we can do things in a totally internally consistent way, all within the survey, uh, based on their answers to the questions about where they expect uh, treasury rates, T-bill rates to be in six and 12 months. Again, we're also going to look at the Duke CFO survey. Um, so this is run for a, a shorter length of time, although they do ask quarterly with some gaps. Um, so they ask these CFOs, what do you expect the one-year return on the S&P and the 10-year return on the S&P to be? So we like this 10-year question since it gets a little bit more at the much longer horizon expected return. Um, and we can calculate a forward rate starting next year. What do you expect the expected return on the market to be for the following nine years? Now, in a year's time, we don't see the realized expected return on the market for the coming nine years. All we see is the spot rate for the following 10 years. And so we're going to need to proxy for a forecast error uh, based on that 10-year expectation. Now, the CFO survey does not ask for expectations of uh, risk-free term structure. And so when calculating risk premia, we are going to impose the expectations hypothesis and just subtract observed one and 10 year yields on treasuries. Okay, so just to give a sense of the variation in the data, um, here's what we back out when we measure forward rates in the Livingston and CFO surveys. So the Livingston survey, uh, this is a six month, six month forward rate. So starting in six months, what is the expected log return on the market for the following six months? And here we see evidence of countercyclicality. So this is clearest in the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, the market drops, forward expected returns spike by quite a lot. One issue you might notice here is because of the fact that the Livingston survey only asks for these expectations every six months, we miss quite a bit of the variation in the data. So during COVID, for example, there was no survey in March 2020 uh, for this six by six month forward rate. So we get end of 2019 and June 2020 uh, when things had already calmed down quite a bit, but there is still a, a slight increase in these forward rates. Now the CFO survey does take place quarterly, so we get a bit more variation. Uh, again, it only goes back to the early 2000s. Um, and again, we see evidence of countercyclicality here. So in 2008, these things spike. Uh, in 2020, here we see cleaner evidence of an increase in, in long horizon forward rates. And then going down, we can ask within the same survey after the fact, what are six month expected returns on the market uh, when you roll six months forward? and call the difference between that and the ex ante forward rate of forecast error. And it, you sort of have to squint here. So there are going to be more interesting patterns once we do things a, a bit more systematically. But you can start to see evidence that when these forward rates spike in bad times, that predictably means that future spot rates will not be as high. So forecast errors are predictably negative when forward rates are elevated and vice versa. Uh, you can see that a bit more clearly for the CFO survey, forward rates spike after the 2008 crash, future spot rates increase, but not by nearly as much as predicted, 
Uh, and that means there's a meaningful forecast error on the downside. Same thing happens uh, when things spike in 2020. Now, as an aside, uh, it's useful to, to stop for a second here and point out that it is necessary in the case of the CFO survey to look at the long horizon forward rate. Otherwise you miss what we argue is quite important counter cyclicality in these return expectations. So if you just look at the short horizon, one year spot expected return on the market, according to these CFOs, here's where we see some evidence of extrapolation. So in, in 2008, this is pretty clear, the market has just crashed. The CFOs expect that it will continue uh, falling, or if not falling, at least having lower than uh, average returns, uh, at least uh, for the following year. But then if you look at the longer horizon forward return expectation, that pro-cyclical extrapolation of past returns is no longer there. And in fact, we see evidence of counter-cyclicality. And because these long horizon return expectations are what matters for price variation, they also matter for, say, uh, investment or hiring decisions, uh, we think it is quite important to look at these long horizon expectations and study them by themselves, uh, as opposed to these shorter horizon expected returns. And what we're going to find is that these long horizon forecasts are in fact too countercyclical relative to their own expectations after. So this is gonna be useful preliminary evidence, um, but again, the data is not quite as rich as you might want. So we're gonna to try to come up with some way of, of measuring these forward return expectations in slightly richer data uh, with derivatives prices. So for this exercise, we're gonna be building off of a series of papers by Ian Martin. Uh, this one, Tan Gao and, and Ian Martin from 2021. Um, and the reason that we build off that paper in particular is because they are studying expected log returns, uh, which is our object of interest. Okay, so as a reminder, what we're interested in is measuring under the physical measure, the expected log return on the market over the coming N periods. And we wanna be able to vary that N so that we can difference and, and get a forward return expectation. Now, what does this paper allow us to do? So they, um, they propose a way to, to measure something that is a proxy for this object of interest, uh, which they and, and we will call the ELVIX. So it is a, an implied vol measure, as we've previewed, um, but it is not quite equivalent to the VIX, as we'll see. Mm -hmm. So this is gonna be the expected discounted using the SDF, discounted gross return on the market times the log return on the market. Now, since this is a risk neutral expectation of a function of just the market's return, we're gonna be able to measure this risk neutral expectation with option prices. Um, this thing is not quite gonna give us exactly what we want though, of course. You can start from a pricing equation, just rearrange based on the definition, the covariance to get that there's gonna be this unobservable gap between what we're interested in, spot rates, and what we can measure based on the LVIX. And that gap is equal to the covariance between discounted returns on the market and log returns on the market. Now, there are, there's a special case in which this covariance term goes away, which is if there is an investor with a log utility of wealth who's fully invested in the market, then their SDF is equal to the reciprocal or proportional to the reciprocal of the return on the market, in which case this first term is just identically one. Um, so the covariance drops out, but, but otherwise this covariance term is, is an unobservable risk premium component that's gonna introduce contamination that we're gonna need some way of controlling for. So Gao and Martin, their argument is if we want to measure something related to expected returns, there may be this unobservable component, but under most statistical or economic models, this unobservable risk premium term is going to be negative. And so the ELVIX accordingly will give us a lower bound, at least for the spot rate that we're interested in. Um, so I think that's a, that's a good starting point, but it, it's not going to be particularly useful in our context. 
is if we're interested in forward return expectations or forward rates, then we have to difference. Um, and so we end up with this difference between covariance terms at different horizons. I don't know which, which one should be bigger, whether the difference is time varying, how time varying it should be. Um, and our argument is that in fact, we can circumvent that issue. We may not be able to measure forward rates particularly well by themselves or spot rates particularly well by themselves, but forecast errors, we are gonna be able to measure somewhat better. So the argument is effectively that the option-based return expectation proxy measured using the LVIX, it may not be an unbiased predictor of returns or tell us in an unbiased fashion what spot return expectations are at different horizons. But the option-based return expectation should predict itself in the sense that the forecast error is to first order a forecast error in physical expected log returns. So let me put some structure on that statement. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We can measure using the LFIX a proxy for forecast error in the equity premium or expected return on the market. And our question is how does this proxy that we can measure using derivatives, how does it relate to the thing we're actually interested in, which is forecast errors in uh, physical subjective expected returns. And so we want to make statements about this expected forecast error ex ante, and all we can do is measure this thing uh, based on the LVIX. And so what is the difference between the two? There is still a difference. There is an unobserved covariance term that still shows up in our context as well. So, so what does it look like? As a starting point, I'm going to assume a jointly log normal world, and then I'll generalize on the next slide. Um, so if things are log normal, then uh, I think it's a little bit easier to interpret. We end up with a covariance between discounted returns on the market and now expected as of T plus N forward looking returns on the market. Now, just as a, as a point of comparison, what is the unobserved covariance term, a risk premium term when we're measuring spot rates? It's a covariance between discounted returns and realized returns. We know realized returns are much more volatile than expected returns. And so this second term in the covariance that we measure when measuring our proxy for forecast errors is gonna be at least uh, theoretically an order of magnitude smaller than the unobserved risk premium term in the case where we're interested in measuring spot rates by themselves. This term is going to relate to the pricing of discount rate or expected return risk rather than realized return risk. Um, and again, because we think realized returns are just much more volatile than expected returns, uh, this thing should be much smaller overall than the covariance in the previous slide. Because of that, we see this thing. We think it's going to be pretty informative about this thing, forecast errors in forward return expectation. We're going to go about testing that, that in a, a few different ways. Uh, but first, let me generalize slightly. Um, so outside of a log normal world, what do we get? So in addition to a proxy for forecast errors using the LVIX, I am also going to proxy for spot expected returns using the LVIX. And then just substitute the second object in the covariance term instead of being the expected log return is now this proxy based on the LVIX, which is, uh, you know, maybe theoretically a bit harder to understand. Um, the nice thing is that empirically we can measure this proxy and compare it directly to realized returns and, and ask how volatile is this thing relative to realized returns on the market? And uh, the answer is that it's about a tenth as volatile. So that is the, the sort of concrete sense in which this covariance term should be an order of magnitude smaller than the covariance term when measuring spot return expectations just by themselves. So just stepping back and summarizing quickly, we're going to be using option prices to measure what we call the LVIX to measure of implied vol. That's going to give us an idea of 
errors in expectations of the equity premium in the future. There's an unobserved risk premium term when trying to measure those errors, but we think that risk premium is small, at least an order of magnitude smaller than the risk premium term when measuring spot return expectations by themselves using option prices. I'll pause here just for a second in case there are questions before getting into our results. Okay, so measurement. Very quickly, we're gonna just use a, the global panel from option metrics. Again, we're interested in uh, expectations of the market return. So we're gonna be considering index options at all available strikes and all available horizons, uh, at least the ones that are liquid enough to make meaningful statements out of. We're going to measure things monthly, apply standard filters. We have, uh, in the appendix, we have like a bunch of different sets of filters uh, that give us, in fact, different estimates of spot rates and forward rates. But the nice thing is that those differences uh, tend to cancel out. So all our statements for forward return expectation forecast errors are robust, regardless of which filters we apply to the data. We have the longest uh, sample possible, uh, at least within this data set for the US sample. So it goes back to 1990. For the international sample, things tend to start after 1990. Um, and we consider 10 major indices that go back at least to 2006, and in some cases back to the early 90s. Now, one downside of this is unlike in the CFO survey, we can't measure forward return expectations at particularly long horizons using option prices just because the options are not liquid out uh, to super long horizons. Um, there's going to be one exception that I'll talk about later, but uh, our baseline is going to be six month horizon, six months forward. So based on option prices, what is the market's expected log return starting in six months for the following six months? The Elvix as a, um, as a risk neutral expectation of a function of the market's returns, of course, there's going to be some way of using option prices to measure this risk neutral expectation. Uh, this is what uh, the integrals end up looking like in this case. Uh, it's effectively an implied vol with a, a different denominator. And there is going to be a question as to where we truncate this integral when calculating things. Um, we have a bunch of different ways of, of truncating, of interpolating, and again, we find the same results for forecast errors in all cases. Right, so we're going to start just by measuring this LVIX and asking, how does the spot rate and forward rate from that LVIX-based proxy measurement look? Uh, so these are contemporaneous, current six-month spot rates and six-month, six-month forward rates for the U.S. measured using option prices. These are risk premia, so subtracting out the risk-free component um, and measuring both at the same point in time. So this is, say, in 2010, what is the six-month expected log return in excess of the risk-free rate? That's in blue. And starting in six months, the expected log return for the following six months, and that's in orange. And so a couple of things. First, we see, uh, again, consistent evidence of countercyclicality, both for spot and forward rates. So in bad times, market return goes down, spot rates spike, go way up. And forward rates go up too, uh, by less than spot rates, because they uh, assume or seem to expect some amount of mean reversion in expected returns going forward. Again, these are measured at the same point in time. So this is not going to tell us forecast errors in forward return expectations. For that, we need to line up forward return expectations with realized future spot rates uh, by lagging one of the two. So this is that exercise. I, I, don't, I don't get a ton out of this, but just to be clear, this is a forecast error. So this is before the crisis hits, forward return expectations are low. Uh, it turns out a crisis hits, and after the spat fact spot, return expectations are very high. That's a forecast error 
the difference between the two. Um, that big forecast error at crisis onset is not going to be particularly predictable. What's going to be predictable is that when forward rates spike after the crisis hits, future spot rates mean revert more quickly than the forward rates expect. And so this forecast error is going to be really what ends up being quite predictable. Okay, so first we're just going to ask, how do the forward rates predict future spot rates? So mincer zarnowitz forecasting type regressions, where the null is an intercept of zero and a slope of one. When forward rates go up by 1%, do future spot rates go up by 1%? So in the US case, they do not. Forward rates go up by 1%, future spot rates go up by 0.7%. So there seems to be some overshooting uh, in the forward return expectations relative to the predictable component of realized future spot rates. And there is a non-zero intercept accordingly. Now, it is true that if you look at the R squared number here, uh, the forward rates pick up quite a bit of the, the predictable variation in future spot rates. So it's not as if they're just totally off in, in understanding the dynamics of the risk premium going forward. Uh, the sign is correct. The R squared is non-trivial. It's just that there's overshooting in the forward rate relative to the realized future spot rate. Outside the US, at least based on this, we measure there's more overshooting and we can collect all of the countries and use country fixed effects to measure within country. So identify within the time series of a given country. Uh, when forward rates go up by 1%, future spot rates go up by about 0.6%. Now, one issue you might have with this is it, it does require that we're measuring forward rates using, using option prices correctly. And so if there's measurement error here, you might worry about attenuation bias in beta one, this slope coefficient. And so what we're gonna do to try to, to address this is instrument this six month, six month forward rate with a shorter horizon forward rate to get rid of at least some of the sort of local noise in the option price-based forward return expectations. And so these are the results of the IV regressions. We sort of like the fact that the estimates end up lining up here. Um, and we, we find pretty consistently across countries, forward rates go up by 1%, realized future spot rates go up by 0.7%. So one way of thinking about this is the market is sort of qualitatively understanding the variation in the future equity premium. But quantitatively, there is excess volatility, excess countercyclicality in the forward return expectations. Now, instead of looking by themselves spot forward expectations, now we're gonna to turn to the forecast errors. So that's again defined as realized future spot minus ex ante forward. On average, these forecast errors are statistically and economically effectively zero. So another way of saying this, and this gets to your question much earlier, Dimitri, is that on average, uh, the sort of risk compensation for the uh, exposure to what we think of as discount rate risk, what you might also equivalently think of as uh, risk in future implied vol, um, on average, the compensation for exposure to that risk is zero. And, and so any explanation for our results is going to have to also explain the fact that, that on average, you earn nothing uh, for buying or selling insurance on uh, forward implied vol. But that zero average forecast error, of course, is going to mask quite a bit of predictable variation along the lines of, of what I've talked about. So when spot and forward rates go up uh, in bad times, quite predictably, in all crises that I've plotted here, I've just taken six as opposed to the three I plotted at the outset, in all cases, future forecast errors are predictably negative. Let, may I jump in quickly? Mm -hmm. uh, so over the period where you have an overlap, how do the magnitude of the errors compare to the magnitude of the errors you got from the surveys? So let me come back to that in, in just a second. They, they are in fact quite close, yeah.
So here's, a, here's just the regression version of the previous plot. So here are the shorter horizon forward rates. We're gonna use these to predict forecast errors. Um, and these are the predicted forecast errors. Highly negative in bad times and small and positive in, in good times, uh, which is gonna generate the zero average. Here's the regression table corresponding to the previous plot. And this is effectively just restating uh, the mincers arnowitz regressions for spot on forward. So forward return expectations go up. That predictably ends up resulting in forecast errors that are negative. And that's significant and pretty consistent across countries. So forward rates are again here overshooting the predictable component of realized future spot return expectations. You can do this in, in different settings. Um, you can do this prediction instead of using the level of forward rates, using revisions in forward rates. Uh, the results end up being quite consistent regardless of, of the sort of testing structure. Now, I'm talking about things in terms of overshooting or excess countercyclicality. I have not really been talking about overreaction or underreaction, in part because it's not totally clear whether this is consistent with overreaction until you specify what is the market apparently overreacting to. Um, and so it is consistent with the story of overreaction to news about risk premium. In bad times, risk premium have gone up. There seems to be sort of excess persistence in forecasts of future risk premium on the basis of that increase. Um, but it is not consistent with overreaction to past returns or extrapolation of past returns. Our results here go in the wrong direction relative to that story. So again, we're finding consistent evidence of excess counter-cyclicality in these forward return expectations. Now, just to get at your question uh, just now about how, how do things line up across options and surveys. So I'm just gonna summarize that all in, in a single table here. We can do the same types of exercises. So predicting future spot rates, predicting future forecast errors from forward rates. In all cases, coefficients are sort of to first order uh, quite close. Um, these are the predictability regressions just in terms of the level of expected returns not net of the risk free rate. Uh, which is why the slope coefficient is slightly different in the option case than the one I just showed you, which was for risk premium. Um, but again, we see consistent overshooting of about the same magnitude. So the, the predictability of forecast errors, that coefficient on forward rates is quite consistent in all three cases. Um, and so are the R-squared values here too. In addition, and we think, again, this is quite interesting, the cyclical variation in all these things is, is quite consistent. So in bad times, when the inverse CAPE is high, uh, future forecast errors in spot return expectations are negative. That's true in the options. That's true in the surveys. All right, so in the remaining five or 10 minutes, I just want to sketch out a couple candidate explanations for what's going on here and why we think this stuff is important. So first, just considering the options data, we do want to ask how, you know, what rational story of risk premia would be consistent with our, uh, our forecast error results. And here, it must be the case that the price of discount rate risk is super volatile and countercyclical. And it, it, in fact, has to switch sides. Um, so uh, under certain sort of standard conditions, that uh, price of discount rate risk cannot change sides. Um, now, there, there are going to be certain models where it can. Um, and we, we go through a couple in, in the paper. Ultimately, we don't spend a ton of time on this question just because um, we think the survey evidence is, is going to be hard to line up with any just rational risk premium based story of our forecast errors. We also ask, does a simple model, externally calibrated model of expectation errors where there's sort of overreaction to objective news uh, about future discount rates, uh, does that work 
quantitatively to make sense of, of our results. And we find some consistent evidence. It seems to work pretty well to pick up the slope coefficients. Um, R squared values are, are not identical to what we find in the data. So there is some rational variation in uh, future discount rates that this model ends up missing. Again, details are in the paper. And we also ask, maybe we're just finding this on a full sample backward looking basis, but uh, those results could plausibly be due to the fact that policy responses were more aggressive than would have rationally been expected ex ante. So crises were not as long lasting after the fact because of those aggressive policy responses. And that's certainly possible. Um, we find that, that that story, at least based on our measurement, doesn't explain uh, most of the variation in forecast errors. So let me turn to, to why we think these results are important. Why, why does it matter that forward return expectations are, are excessively countercyclical? So first, coming back to this issue of excess volatility in prices. Uh, when prices are depressed, that partly reflects high risk premia at all future horizons based on our results. Some of those high expected future risk premia we're finding do not line up with expectations of expected returns after the fact. And so if, if investors didn't overestimate the persistence of discount rates, we can ask what would variation in prices look like? And so we have sort of a back of the envelope exercise to quantify this. So again, coming back to uh, the accounting identity for the price dividend ratio, we're interested in expected returns at all horizons. We're not going to be considering contemporaneous one period expected returns. We're interested in forward expected returns, expected returns after T plus one. Um, and we're going to take out the risk free rate component. We're not interested in variation in this thing. OK, so we've got this set of forward return expectations. We, we want to break that up further. So forward rates are equal to rationally expected future spot return expectations minus predictable forecast errors. And we just want to know how, how much do these predictable forecast errors matter for variation in prices? And so we're going to start just by predicting forecast errors using the same exact predictability exercise that I just showed you. Uh, six months, six months forward, we predict that forecast error using a shorter horizon forward. Now we do need forecast errors at all future horizons, not just at six month, six month horizon. Um, and so to, to get a sense of the full term structure of forecast errors, we're gonna turn to Eurostox index options where we do have data out for horizons past a year uh, with those options. Um, and in fact, we can go out to eight years and ask, what are predicted forecast errors at all dates and at all future horizons out to eight years? And what, is, what are the decay properties of forecast errors? So if I think that uh, predictable forecast errors are, are one basis point at the six month, six month horizon, let's say, what does that mean for the seven year horizon? And what we find there is that the term structure of those predictable forecast errors is, is pretty much flat. Um, if anything, actually, the longer horizon forecast errors on an annualized basis are larger, typically, than the shorter horizon ones. So we're just going to, to be conservative, assume that there's a flat term structure of forecast errors. That's going to allow us to plug into this discounted sum. We just discount each predictable forecast error term with this row from the log linearization. And then we're going to compare the predictable variation in discounted forecast errors at all horizons to the variation in the price dividend ratio, uh, which we will do on a repurchase adjusted basis just to make things a bit more stationary, but things work equally if, if we don't. Evan, just so you know, we've reached the 60 minute marks. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was okay. I'll, uh, I'll wrap up then. So why don't I just 
wrap up just by talking very quickly through these predictable forecast errors, and then I'm happy to take questions on the other implications. Um, okay, so the discounted forecast errors here are in orange. And these tell us how much do forecast errors matter for prices? And so the way to read this plot is effectively if at the depths of the crisis in 2008, there were not predictable forecast errors in future return expectations. If markets understood that the risk premium would mean revert uh, more quickly than they thought, there would have been about 50% less of a drop in prices, at least based on this back of the envelope exercise, and closer to 80% uh, during the depths of the COVID crash. Now, this thing does not explain all of the variation in the price dividend ratio, of course, but we think it's meaningful in magnitude, especially during crisis. Um, again, I'm happy to talk through these, these other implications. Uh, if there are questions on them in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just skip over them. We think this matters for understanding, at least in part, inelastic demand for equities, facts about the equity term structure from dividend claims, um, as well as speaking directly to the cyclicality of subjective risk premia. So we're finding quite consistently that forward risk premia are counter cyclical. And that is even though in some cases we find evidence the short horizon return expectations are pro cyclical. And so some of the disagreement we think stems from just differences in, in the horizon of return expectation in these different contexts. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up. Again, what we do here is we introduce a few new methods to measure the term structure of expected equity premia and expected returns on the market at future dates. Um, and we find quite consistently that there is counter cyclicality in this, those forward return expectations and too much. So excess counter cyclicality. Uh, and we think that matters for lots of asset pricing facts. And I, I'll be very happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks so much. Excellent, Eben. Uh, thank you very much. We'll uh, open the floor for open mic questions. And Chris is already uh, with a hand up. Uh, so let's go, Chris. Thank you, Christian. Can you hear me? Uh, very, very well. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Eben. That was very interesting analysis. Um, uh, so I just want to go back for a second to the starting point uh, with the option-based data. And, and so in particular, the measurement simply. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to me that in the end, you're taking your first moment to be right determined by your second moment. And that was very clear in some of the pictures that we saw, right? And then you can argue physical risk neutral, et cetera. But, but, but so it's, unless I'm misunderstanding something, if you just take a Taylor series expansion, the higher moments should show up and essentially you're just ignoring the higher moments right and so it seems to me you could redo this whole analysis with a, in my eyes at least a better approximation to the first moment that includes the, the higher moments or, or am, I, am i missing something and so why aren't you doing that so the way that to think about what we're doing is we are approximating around a world of um log utility and uh, that may be a different benchmark for approximation than, than the one that, that you might be interested in. Either way, it is it is true that, that we could use some higher order terms that we are simply not considering here. Yeah, so we, we haven't done that exercise. It, it's something that we could do. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Good. So I guess uh, we've uh, we've uh, some stuff to digest here.